plutôt heureux, bonjour. Après un atelier agité ce matin, mais qui a beaucoup stimulé nos neurones, euh, je pense. Euh, C'est maintenant le professeur José Luis Cordero euh, qui a la parole euh, et qui va nous, euh, donner toute une, nous faire toute une conférence sur un de ses thèmes favoris. D'ailleurs, je dois dire tout de suite, le livre de M. Cordero, comme les livres de tous les intervenants, se trouve en bas à la librairie. Donc, si vous voulez vous faire dédicacer des livres par les intervenants, bon, par hasard, j'ai le livre de M. Cordero à la main. Donc, vous pouvez acheter le livre. Si vous êtes étudiant, vous pouvez vous faire offrir le livre à la librairie qui est là et vous pouvez avoir une signature de l'auteur. Et ça vaut pour tous les auteurs de la semaine de la science. Alors, on n'est pas très nombreux dans la salle, mais je sais qu'on est en streaming. Donc, on doit être plusieurs centaines en streaming. Donc, euh, J'appelle immédiatement euh, le professeur Cordeo, José Luis, euh, pour donner sa conférence. Et merci beaucoup. C'est un plaisir d'être ici à Marrakech. Euh, comme je parle anglais mieux que, que français, je vais continuer en anglais. Donc, euh, j'avais un petit vidéo que vous pouvez voir à YouTube. Introduction to Transhumanism. Euh, alors, je recommande que, que vous voyez cela. C'est une introduction de 10 minutes, mais on n'est pas le temps pour cela. Donc, euh, je vais parler sur euh, the general idea of transhumanism from the human to the post-human age. I have been working for a long time with different uh, transhumanist organizations like Humanity Plus, that used to be called World Transhumanist Association, the Millennium Project, Singularity University, and the World Academy of Art and Science. Within the Millennium Project, we look long-term future of humanity, and we continuously publish um, reports about the 15 global challenges, and um, every year we publish a book of, of, on the future. Uh, just now, we publish um, Work and Technology 2050 Scenarios. You can download this for free from the website of the Millennium Project. And here we, we envision three futures, a good one, a bad one, a middle of the road one. We have also published the studies about different regions of the world, like um, about Latin America, which is where I grew up. And I had the pleasure to present that at the World Economic Forum, Davos, uh, Switzerland. And also to be on TV with uh, people like uh, Donald Trump talking about the future of humanity. Um, humanity is stabilizing um, demographically. If you look at the projections from the uh, 18th, 19th century into the 21st century, basically the population of the planet for the first time is beginning to stabilize and it is already declining in many countries. In most of Europe, the population is stable and declining in Italy, in Spain, in Germany, in Russia, and also in Japan and Korea in Asia. However, what keeps on growing is the GDP, the economic uh, output. If you look at the scale also, you can see it is a vertical logarithmic scale, which means an exponential growth of the economy in the last few years. We went from $1,000 per person per year to $10,000 per person per year, and some countries already are reaching uh, $100,000 per person per year. So the economy is growing exponentially. You can also see that in the stock market. This is the Dow Jones index of the New York Stock Exchange. And you can see for the last two centuries, an exponential growth. It doesn't matter if there are wars, if there are pandemics, it is an exponential growth of the economy. In fact, um, the first country in human history that doubled its income per capita was the United Kingdom during the Industrial Revolution. And it took between 1780 and 1838 to double for the first time in human history uh, its GDP. After the United Kingdom, other countries, the USA, Japan, etc., have been doubling faster and faster their economic output. Today, the big leader is China. China, every seven, eight, nine, nine years, is doubling its GDP per capita. And all of these began with the Industrial Revolution that is being uh, followed in other countries like Japan. Japan began the Industrial Revolution only 
in the last uh, um, uh, century. And um, Japan is a very small country. Japan is smaller than Morocco. However, it has three times the population of Morocco. Um, so it is uh, highly populated in terms of density, but it is growing very fast, uh, especially in the last generation. Until the 18th century, humanity was caught in what is called the Maltusian trap. And there was basically no long-term economic development until, again, the 19th century with the Industrial Revolution, where the world economy grew 100% in the 19th century, then 400% in the 20th century, and this keeps on growing exponentially. This will be the best time in history to be alive because the economy and all other variables are improving. In, in fact, we talk that we are moving from scarcity to abundance. We are leaving behind the economics of scarcity and moving forward into the economics of abundance. But there are always groups who oppose technology, like the Amish. You probably know the Amish in the USA. They live like the, in the 18th century and they don't want to change. And I grew up in South America and there are some Indian communities like the Yanomami. They don't want to use any technology of the last 2000 years. Um, so probably even if we go farther back in time, 5,000 years ago, there were people who didn't want the wheels. The wheel was an invention they didn't want. So there have always been people against technology. In fact, 200 years ago, during the Industrial Revolution in England, there were the Luddites. The Luddites that destroyed the machines because they said that the machines were taking away our jobs. Fortunately, the machines won, and that is why we live in such an advanced society today. Um, so let's look at the world. Um, normally, we center it in Europe, but if you live, uh, um, I saw this cow, this is an irony, a cow that uses also this map of the world, but uh, if you go to China, this is how the Chinese look at the world, and you know that one out of five people is Chinese one out of five, and they look at the world center on China. China, in fact, means the middle kingdom. The Chinese name has two characters. The first one is middle, and the second one is kingdom. So China literally means the middle kingdom, and they look at the world like that. So we need to have our view centered on how we think of the world. The Australians, for example, they like to look at the world upside down. Or if you are in the Middle East, you look at the Dubai world islands. So I want people to look at the world with a new face and also with a new behind. And we are going to leave this planet finally and uh, colonizing the rest of the solar system in this decade. Actually, I am very proud. I was part of the first generation of Mars trained astronauts of Spain just before the pandemic in 2019. We were a, a team of five people training to go onto Mars this was a simulation. We might not go to Mars yet, but some humans will go to Mars by the end of this decade. Um, I am an MIT engineer who has moved from energy into biotech because biotech will be the largest industry of the world in the next two decades. Um, I was a founding faculty at Singularity University in the year 2009 when it was financed mostly by Google and NASA and support of other big tech companies like Cisco, Autodesk, and at Singularity University, we talk about the exponential changes and how by 2045, we will reach the technological singularity. And as you can read in the subtitle, that is the year when man becomes immortal. But not only men, also women. Women will also become immortal. All of us should become immortal at the latest by 2045. This is based on the ideas of my friend Ray Kurzweil, and, and he talks about exponential change, accelerating of development, and how soon we will reach the technological singularity, which is the time when artificial intelligence surpasses all of human intelligence combined. And we expect this to happen by 2045 at the latest. Uh, some of the students here are too young to have seen this technology, but I used this 40 years ago when I was studying computer science. This was 1K of memory, 1K. Basically, 10 by 100. There were different types, but 10 by 100 is 1,000. This is 1K of memory, and I used this 1K of memory 40 years ago. Then the first 
um, floppy disks were created. And these were better because you could change. This was also 1K, but this 1K was better because you could erase. So I like to say I use 1K mechanic and 1K electromagnetic. And in Spanish, we say 1K plus 1K makes 1KK, 1KK. This is what we had 30 years ago. Fortunately, technology kept on advancing, as you know, and we moved from KK to these devices to other better devices, and this continues. And this is increasing exponentially. But not only in computer science, also in medicine and biotechnology. And companies now sequence your genome uh, completely or partially, like um, 23andMe. This is my human genome. I will show you only the partial sequence so that you don't know everything about me. But once you sequence your genome, you would know the diseases that you might have. What is the probability of you having cancer, having Alzheimer's, etc.? Also, you can um, reconstruct your history. And this is my paternal line, where my ancestors come from my father's side. And you can see that I descend from Genghis Khan. So no one should mess around with me. On my mother's side, you can see, um, on my maternal side, you can see that I come from Maria Antoniet. So I have a good pedigree between Genghis Khan and Maria Antoniet. That means that we will be able to track our history backwards and verify for the first time if your father is really your father. But more interesting than looking into the past is looking into the future. And this is one experiment I did with one of my students sharing genes, a theoretical experiment, to see how our children could be. And uh, this is what will be the norm in 10 years. In fact, you are all part of the last human generation that has not been designed. All of you are here by mistake. In the future, we will design our children the way we want. There is an exponential change in knowledge, incredibly changing humanity through what is called the three waves from the agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution, and now the intelligence revolution. Also, life spans are increasing. At the time of the Roman Empire, life expectancy was 20, 25 years. At the beginning of the 20th century, it had doubled to 50 years. Now it's doubling again, and soon it will double again. So life is augmenting, it's increasing, and with more and more education, more time for knowledge generation. And there is a big disruption from the companies of the past. Um, you can see Mickey Mouse is bigger than the petroleum company of Venezuela. So this changes very fast. We need to move from manufacturing into manufacturing. And let me give you another example of Chile. Chile is a country that has been, that began with raw, um, raw materials and now it's moving into new technologies because of these technological disruptions. Everything is being disrupted. As you probably know, Uber is the largest taxi company in the world and it doesn't have one car or Facebook, the largest um, marketing company and it doesn't really have uh, any personnel or media equipment and uh, Alibaba also for marketing, Airbnb for hotels, etc., etc., etc. At Singularity University, we used to say that in this exponentially changing world, you need to reinvent yourself continuously because if you don't Uber yourself, you will get Kodak. So we need to reinvent ourselves continuously. Futurists talk about four ways, which is to be passive, like an ostrich. You hide your head in the sand. You don't want to see what is going to happen. Horrible. A little less bad is to be reactive, like the firefighters that come when there is a fire. It is a little bit better to be preactive when you buy insurance, for example, to be prepared for anything. But the best way is to be proactive because you can build your future. You can create your future. So I hope we don't have ostriches here because ostriches are not from Morocco. But if we have ostriches, they should be technological ostriches to see the future. 15 years ago, I, saw, I, I met the famous science fiction author, Sir Arthur C. Clarke, who wrote many books and then Hollywood movies like Space Odyssey 2001. But he's more famous for the three laws of the future. First law of the future. When a famous scientist says that something is possible, 
he is probably right. But when he says it is impossible, he's probably wrong. Second law of the future, the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture past those limits into the impossible. And third law of the future, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And we are going to see magic in the next 20 years. As I was showing um, with the computers of the past, 30, 40 years ago, uh, that is when we began having personal computers. At MIT, where I graduated uh, uh, almost 40 years ago, there were no computers. I used a primitive technology to write my thesis, which is called a typewriter. I don't know if you have seen typewriters in the museum. I used that at MIT to write my uh, master's thesis. Well, 20 years ago, cell phones were going around the world. 10 years ago, Google, Facebook. What is going to happen in the next 10, 20, 30 years? We are going to have immortal, ageless cells. Um, that is the reason why I, pull, I published my best-selling book, uh, uh, which is now in uh, seven languages. So the death of death, talking about the incredible advances we are going to see in all fields, but basically also in rejuvenation technologies. Because I believe we are between the last mortal generation and the first immortal generation. And it is for you to decide, because in 20 years, we will have rejuvenation technology. So my book came out in Russian, in Chinese, in Turkish, in, in many, many languages. So I'm really excited. These ideas are also uh, exposed by my friend Ray Kurzweil, that is finishing uh, the new edition of his famous book, The Singularity is Near, called The Singularity is Nearer, Nearer when he ratifies that by 2045, as, um, and we talk about this at Singularity University, we will reach the technological singular singularity through the convergence of four main technologies. Nanotechnology that studies atoms, biotechnology that studies cells, infotechnology that studies bits, and cognotechnology that studies neurons. The two technologies on top are called nano and bio, the hardware of life, the hardware of life. And the two technolo technologies on the bottom, Info and Cogno, are the software of life. And there will be two incredible achievements. In 2029, we will pass the Alan Turing test. And in 2045, we will reach the technological singularity and biological immortality. Why? Because everything is changing exponentially faster, smaller, cheaper, and better. As I explained before, from 1K to now, I have devices of terabytes uh, at this bosom. Um, but we don't understand exponential change because we think linearly. If I give 30 linear steps, after 30 steps, I have walked 30 meters. But if I walk exponentially, if I could double, 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 after 30 doublings, I could have, I could have gone around planet Earth 26 times and walked over 1 billion meters. We don't understand this again because we think linearly, but technology is changing exponentially. That is why in the next two decades, we are going to see more technological changes than in the last two thousand years. I repeat because this is something that has to be clear. In the next two decades, more changes than in the last two millennia. We have seen nothing yet of the incredible changes ahead. As I mentioned, from one K to one Terra. But in every area, also in medicine, human genome sequencing. The first human genome took 13 years and cost over $1 billion. Today, you can do it for a couple of hundred dollars in two hours. And this is going to cost uh, only $10 and one minute very soon. So this is incredibly exponential, both in cost and in time. And it's revolutionizing medicine, because at the end, we are only three gigabytes of data. We biologically only have three gigabytes of uh, information. And in the year 2000, scientists were able to create an artificial virus. In the year 2010, an artificial bacteria. And by the year 2045, we will be able to create artificial homo sapiens. It is only a matter of time and complexity. 
And this relates to medicine because today more and more people understand that aging is a disease, but a curable disease. Uh, in fact, in the last couple of decades, we have been able to double the lifespan of mice. We have mice that live the equivalent of 200 human years today. We have mosquitoes that live the equivalent of 400 human years today. And we have mice that live a thousand human years equivalent today. This was done in the last two decades. What do you think we will do in the next two decades? We will be extending and extending lifespans. In fact, uh, we already know that there are immortal cells. And this was discovered with a patient called Henrietta Lacks, who died in 1951 of cancer. Even though she died, her cancer is still alive. This is when it was discovered that cancer cells stop aging. Cancer cells do not age. And see how simple this is, because cancer cells did not go to university. And cancer cells did not spend millions of dollars to become immortal. This is the proof of concept, concept that we will reach immortality very soon because cancer cells did it. But not only cancer cells are immortal, also germ cells. And all of us have germ cells in our bodies. Our germ cells do not age, just like the cancer cells. On top of that, we have discovered immortal organisms like hydras and some medusas that are biologically immortal. And the most interesting fact is that bacteria that divide symmetrically, which were the first life forms in our planet, they do not age. Bacteria that divide symmetrically are biologically immortal. When life appeared on our planet, the purpose of life was life, better life, longer life. And this should be our purpose too. My friend Aubrey de Grey has been talking about this for the last 20 years and in aging. But he was called by MIT, by my alma mater, a charlatan in 2005. People said that this was impossible, that we could not cure aging, we could not reverse aging. 14 years later, MIT Technology Review said that Aubrey is actually right and that old age, old age is over if you want it, because now we know that we can reverse aging. Uh, in fact, um, German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer said that all truth goes through three stages. First stage, it is ridiculed. Second stage, it is violently opposed. And third stage, it is accepted as self-evident. In the year 2045, in the Science Week of 2045, we will remember today when we were so primitive that we let people die. There will be no death by 2045. As my friend uh, Ray Kurzweil explains in his book, Fantastic Voyage, live long enough to live forever. And he explains the three bridges of immortality. Bridge one in the 2010s, bridge two with biotechnology in the 2020s, and bridge three in the 2030s with nanotechnology. This will take us into 2045 with artificial intelligence and the cure of aging and reversal of aging. Many companies are working on this now, like Google. Google created a company called Calico, California Life Company, to reverse aging. But also Mark Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg and his wife Priscilla Chan, they have said that they will cure all diseases, including aging, in the lifetime of their daughter. But if you don't like Facebook or Google, Microsoft also said that they will cure cancer because now that we can sequence cancer, we can see the mutations that stop aging in cancer cells. This will be the largest industry in human history. I don't know what you plan to do, but if you are not into biotech, you are in the wrong field. This is growing first from millions to billions and to trillions, the largest industry in the history of humanity. All the billionaires are realizing that this, this is almost unstoppable and they are beginning to invest, like Jeff Bezos, who created a company called Altos, where he put $3 billion with other billionaires to reverse aging. This is just beginning. We know also because at the Nobel Prize of Medicine in 2012, Shinya Yamanaka, that I visited at the University of Kyoto in Japan, he discovered that there are genes that control aging and you can modify these genes to be young or to be old. 
we know today, scientifically, Nobel Prize in Medicine, that aging is controllable and is reversible, reversible. My friend, also David Sinclair at Harvard University, he has been able to rejuvenate the eyes of blind mice, mice that had the equivalent of about 80 years human age. They were modified genetically and their eyes uh, could have vision again. They were only 20 years old. This was done in 2020, top article in Nature magazine. So all these technologies are converging, nano, bio, info, and cogno, into the technological singularity, as I mentioned, by 2045, together with artificial reality that will take us into another world uh, with nanotechnology, incredible developments. With nanotechnology, there will be no waste in the future. There will only be raw materials in the wrong places. And biotechnology, we will be able to do incredible things biologically. Uh, including glowing plants. This is one of my students at Singularity University who created this company, Glowing Plants. We will bring species back to life, like the holy mammoth, uh, through these de-extinction capabilities. And we will be able to clone, as it was proven with uh, Dolly the sheep. And now, in fact, in Singapore, the, in Biopolis, where they have a laboratory with half a million mice to do uh, all types of experiments, but even the Russians, you know, the Russians, they want some cloning. Um, but you have to be careful about the Russians. You never know when they are sad or upset. Uh, also, the Hindus. The Hindus think that we should be able to have all this rejuvenation technologies if you want to think also spiritually. Anyway, all of this is changing exponentially, as I was mentioning. Um, telecommunications keeps on advancing. We are now on 5G. Soon we will have 6G. And that will allow our brains to be connected to internet, to the cloud in the next 10 years. And we will be born with a connection to internet probably. And we will want more and more bandwidth. Um, we will move into a global brain where everything will be connected to everything. The internet of things, cars, computers, everything connected to everything. And artificial intelligence is moving along very fast. As you probably know in 1997, uh, Deep Blue, from IBM beat the world chess um, champion, Gary Kasparov. And then again, IBM in 2011 developed Watson that beat humans in the game Jeopardy on TV. And now uh, Watson is being used on healthcare and many other things. And uh, Google created AlphaGo for these developments uh, in different areas as well. And we get to the final technology, which is the most interesting because it's Cogno, Cogno technology about the brain. Because the brain is the most complex structure in the known universe. We don't know of anything more complex than the brain of a man. Or actually, yes, the brain of a woman. That's more complex. But besides the brain of a man or a woman, nothing more complex today. Uh, so it is the final frontier, and there are many experiments and knowledge. My friend Ray Kurzweil published a book also about how to create a mind and when we will reach the complexity of the human brain and how the brain is connected, the human connectome, and how the brain evolved. The brain evolved and keeps on evolving biologically, but it takes millions of years for biological evolution. And now we can do this uh, with engineering very soon. And we are creating now an exocortex, a new exocortex that will give us super intelligence. We are moving from the three traditional parts of the brain, reptilian, limbic, and neocortex, into a, an exocortex that will give us super intelligence. What is the complexity of a brain? A brain has 10 to the 11 neurons. Each neuron has about 1,000 connections, 10 to the 14 synapses, and each neuron uh, synapses computes at different frequencies, uh, 10 hertz, 100 hertz. If you are very fast, 1,000 hertz. This gives 10 to the 17 operations per second. That is the complexity of a human brain, which is a lot, but it's really not that much. And we will reach this complexity in the next 20 years if we don't talk about the mind, the spirit, and the soul. And there are the smaller brains, of course. There are also smaller brains like Homer Simpson here. Uh, now scientists have been able to connect the brains of different animals, of mice, of monkeys, and including with humans that are being connected to computers and to the internet. And there are little devices that allow you to read what is going on in your mind. Elon Musk has a new company called Neuralink, 
whose objective is to connect the brain to artificial intelligence and to the cloud. And he's beginning human trials by the end of this year. We will be augmenting our intelligence with artificial intelligence soon. I have brought several times to Madrid some of these intelligent robots like Sofia. Sofia, uh, which is the most advanced uh, robot and really beautiful. She's a copy of the British actress Audrey Hepburn. And she read my book. When I met Sofia, she said, I read your book and it took me one second. Imagine a robot can not read anything in one second immediately. Um, Asimov from Honda before, you could see the evolution, but there are many other types of robots even more interesting in the future. And they will have feelings. This is the MIT uh, Robotics Lab, where they are studying the feelings of robots. And robots will be fantastic. Um, really fantastic also for all kinds of dreams. Uh, but they could be bad robots as well, bad robots. So, is it going to be good or is it going to be bad? And actually, even bad, bad robot sex, horrible things. But anyway, it depends on when, where you are. If you are in Western countries, you might think robots are bad. If you are in Eastern countries, in Asia, East Asia, you think robots are good. All Japanese have grown up with Astro Boy, and they believe robots are good. They are so good that they even want to marry robots in Japan. So, but this is not a fight between humans or robots. It is the fusion, the merging of human and machine intelligence. And we have been many, seen many of these experiments like in the London Olympics or in the World Cup in Brazil in 2014 or the Cybathlon that began in 2016, which is about uh, humans enhanced with technology. There was also at the Tokyo Olympic Games a, a robotic competition as well. And my MIT professor, Marvin Minsky, is very famous for saying, will robots inherit the earth? Yes, but they will be us. We will be them. This is the future. And this is what transhumanism is about. It's a scientific philosophy based on the humanism of the enlightenment so that we humans will transcend our limitations, our biological limitations. We are descended from monkeys, um, but we have to be careful because we are evolving. We don't want to finish like that. So we might finish instead like that. In the next few years, we are basically going to cure all diseases. We are going to cure these horrible diseases. There will be no paraplegics. There will be no Parkinson's. There will be no Alzheimer's and there will be no aging in the next two decades. So I want to be younger in the future, not through a Russian application like FaceApp. I want to be younger because we are going to have, to have biological technologies, but we need to meditate into the future. The future is exciting. We need also to have ethical considerations. And I love uh, Chinese culture also. You know, they talk about yin and yang. This is very complex. There is a lot of yin and yang. And inside yin yang, there is even little yin yang. So this is complex, complex, complex. But the Chinese say, Let's not blame darkness. Let's light up a candle. The future is fantastic and we need to illuminate the future. And we have two possibilities in the future. To go into the past, like North Korea, or to go into the illuminated future of the future, um, South Korea. So I finish with this fantastic Chinese word that means crisis. Crisis in Chinese has two characters. And I used to draw it backwards, upside down. I didn't know how to draw it well, but now I can write it well. And it has two characters. The first character is danger, but the second character is opportunity. We live in the most incredible times that humanity has ever seen. Where do you want to be in the future or in the past? Shukran. Thank you, Jose. Uh, thank you for your enthusiasm. Thank you for your positive uh, view. Obviously, not everybody agrees with you. Um, we will take a couple of questions. Uh, Saad, is there a, a mic or are we going to take questions through, through this magic thing? Has anyone a question, a question for uh, uh, Dr. Cordeiro? There is it my mic? Yes. It can be in French, no? I understand. Bien sûr. Bien sûr. Une question en français en 
in English. Well, first question there. In Spanish. In Spanish, even better. <laughs> Hello. Yes. So you, you said that there were some uh, good use and bad use of this future technology. So what do you think we, we should uh, do to uh, limit uh, the risk of a bad user? Well, I think people need to be aware that all these technologies are coming and it is a matter of time. We really are going to have rejuvenation technologies very soon. Um, we are going to have artificial intelligence at human levels. By the year 2029, we will pass the Alan Turing test. So people need to understand that this is going to happen. So we need to be ready for that in a positive way because technologies can be used for good or bad. I'll give just two examples. One is fire. Fire was invented, one of the first inventions of humans about half a million years ago. And you can use fire to heat up your home and to cook or to burn people. The Catholic Church actually used fire for burning many people, not good but fire can be used for good things. Uh, nuclear energy. Nuclear energy can be used for generating electricity or for making nuclear weapons. So my point is that we need to understand that these technologies are coming and we need to use them for better use, uh, uses, ethical principles. So people need to understand, and the more that you know, better that this is happening so that you get prepared. Um, really, like rejuvenation technologies, all the young people here, if you behave, you should become almost immortal or you will be able to live as long as you want. If you get tired of living in a thousand years, then you switch off. But you can maybe live for thousands of years in the future. So be prepared for that. Get educated at the university here. If they live 1000 years, they would have the, their adolescent crisis when they are 300, something like that. <laughs> they will be difficult for their parents. <laughs> thank you. Is there another question? Yeah. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jose. I'm Zakaria Khabush. I'm a PhD student here. I Can you speak in microphone, please? Thank you. Okay. So, uh, I just, I have two questions. So, uh, the first question is uh, about uh, the, uh, the title of this, of this uh, conference related to the subject that you just talked about. You said that post-human human, human age will be great. So, is that means that after we cure all diseases, after we become connected to the internet, after we, come, we become immortal, that means that we will not be longer considered as humans. That's why you call that post-human age. That's the first. Um, well, excellent question. Thank you. Um, well, six million years ago, our monkey ancestors were probably thinking about what would be the future of monkeys and they would talk about monkeyhood. Instead of humanhood or humanity, they would talk about chimpanzee and chimpanzeehood. So we need to think that we are still evolving, but it takes millions of years biologically. Uh, science and technology can do it very fast to keep on improving the human condition. If you watch the video, uh, Google for it in YouTube, in YouTube, introduction to transhumanism. Most transhumanism believe in the improvement of the human condition with three main pillars, super intelligence, super longevity, and super happiness. And we believe that we will be extremely happy, extremely intelligent, and extremely longevous in the future. For those who want, again, this is not mandatory. If someone wants to die, let them die. Uh, if someone wants to be stupid, let him be stupid. If someone wants to be unhappy, sadly, let him be unhappy. But most of humanity, I think, is enlightened enough. And they will want to be longer, to be more intelligent and to be more happy. So you young people, I wish you the best. You are intelligent. You are in one of the best, if not the best, university in Morocco. You have a bright future ahead. And think about the incredible opportunities ahead. This is the best time ever to be alive. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, we will take one more question, not from the, the, the room. I'm really sorry because we are already late. But there is one question uh, there. Can you read it, uh, Jose? We say things are getting better, but how are we sure our definition of better is actually right? Are we sure we're not forgetting something more important than what was presented um, yesterday, the last presentation, um, 
uh, watch it in YouTube, <laughs> was very good. And uh, it talks about how really the human condition is improving. There are certain publications that you can check for free in internet. One of those is Our World in Data. Our World in Data. Another one, the Millennium Project, uh, where I work, the Millennium Project. And you can download our report to the year 2050. And you will see how really conditions are getting better. But let me tell you, uh, you saw about 2,000 years, life expectancy would be 20 years. I think all of you could be dead because even the youngest student probably have 21 here. I could be dead three times because I'm 60, you know? So not only we are living longer, we are living healthier lives. We are incre incredibly more prosperous. We are richer, richer than our ancestors. We are more educated. You can read and write. Our ancestors couldn't read and write. And our ancestors were thin and starving. Now the problem is the opposite. Now the problem is obesity. We have too much food. So it's incredible how the human condition is improving. Obviously, obesity is not good, but it was worse to be hungry all the time. So if you look at publication about publication, comparing many different parameters, the human condition is getting better. But you know what? Even though this is better than 100 years into the past, 10 years into the future will be better than today. Better than today. So get excited. This is truly the best time ever in human history to be alive. So once again, thank you so much. You have a great future, so keep on dreaming. Thank you. A round of applause for Jose Cordero. Thank you, Jose. Okay.